I don't have a farming background. I was actually born just before the war, but my parents decided that it would be safer if we lived in the countryside. Uh, we actually lived in Leeds, I was born there. So we moved to a village outside Leeds. And in fact, the first part of the, of the war was, was marvellous for me because there was this beautiful open countryside with nobody in it, <laughs> nothing happening. I could go off as soon as I could walk and be a bit independent. I could go off with my dog into the countryside and just enjoy things. No problem. But obviously I picked up things about the war. My father was in the Air Force and so on and so forth. But that interest in the countryside uh, became very important. I went to school in Leeds and my parents were very concerned about making sure I had a good education. Then it came to the question of what to do afterwards. Uh, the general idea was that you should become a doctor or a dentist or a lawyer or something like this, none of which appealed at all. Uh, but then some friends who had a farm in Yorkshire invited me to go and stay there and I, I got to know them and the farm and I started to think, well, perhaps there's more to this farming thing than I had really understood when I was younger. So I decided to do a degree in, in fact, agricultural botany at Reading University, which was very well known for, still is, for its agriculture. And that was one of the best decisions I ever made, really. First of all, because it meant I had to spend a year working on a farm in order to see all the farm process going around the whole yearly cycle before going to university. That in itself was marvellous. I mean, really, working with a team of people outdoors all year round, watching and being involved in helping with everything that went on on the farm. So, I did my degree, I became interested in plant pathology, diseases of plants, and in particular in the coevolution of hosts, that is in, in this case cereal crops, and the pathogen I was interested in, which was uh, the powdery mildew or the fungus that causes powdery mildew disease. Uh, so the question is, you know, you introduce new resistant varieties and then the pathogen gets used to those or varieties, the new varieties, learns, if you like, how to grow on those resistant varieties and then you lose it. So the breeder has to produce a new resistant variety and the cycle goes on and on. And in fact, in those early years of trying to understand the pathogen and its coevolution, I did have quite a lot of interaction and uh, collaboration with Swedish plant pathologists, Bent Leostam and Arne Wiebär, so I got to visit Sweden at a very early stage too. <laughs> that was interesting in itself, of course. degree, what sort of job was I going to do? Well, I worked at the Plant Breeding Institute in Cambridge, which was a very famous institution at the time, which had built up a reputation on the basis of having scientists working together with breeders. So the scientists could inform the breeders about you know, the latest developments in plant science, relevant plant science, and the breeders could set problems in effect for the scientists. So the problem that I was interested in, which I did my PhD on, 
I was really starting to think about this question of the interaction, the evolution, host and pathogen, how to deal with it. And the obvious problem was that agriculture had gone down this route of plant breeding and producing or relying on the self-fertility of wheat and barley particularly in order to be able to produce monocultures, that is to say new varieties where you rely on the self-fertility of the wheat in this case in order to produce a large amount of seed of one genotype. So all the plants that belong to a variety, as they were called, are identical, genetically identical. You then grow these on very large fields, and many large fields if the variety becomes popular. So what you're doing is exposing just one genotype one set of genes to the huge pathogen population. So if you produce a resistant variety, it's resistant while it's being grown on a small scale, but as you gradually increase the scale, you increase the exposure to the pathogen population, and eventually some form of the pathogen population says, aha, I can grow on that resistant variety. <laughs> it's easier for me than all you others. Uh, so here we go. And of course, if a strain, a particular genotype of the pathogen can grow on just one plant of that new monoculture, then it can grow on all of them and it can spread and grow very rapidly. So. That was the continuous, what was called the boom and bust cycle at the time, of breeders producing new resistant varieties, the pathogen recognising eventually how to overcome uh, the resistance of that new variety, and down it went. That was the bust. But then a new, a different breeder perhaps came up with a new variety, a new boom, and then another bust, which is not a very sensible way of doing things really. So the obvious thing is, well, we need to somehow reduce this monoculture idea in the field. We need to have more diversity. And I was fortunate then working in Cambridge with a guy, a geneticist uh, at the university, John Barrett. He got interested in the problem. We eventually learnt each other's language, as it were, me as the pathologist, him as the geneticist, and came up with a very simple idea, which had certainly been used before, but we put perhaps a, a sharper focus scientifically on it, which was to use variety mixtures. In other words, if we take, for the sake of argument, three varieties, each of which has a different kind of resistance to the same pathogen, then that immediately creates more of a problem for the pathogen to deal with. And so we tried this in the field and it worked. It worked extremely well. You could have a really dramatic effect on slowing down the rate at which disease develops if you just have a, a simple mixture. An awful lot of work has been done on that since and it's generally been shown in meta-studies and so on that indeed this is what happens. Which doesn't surprise me at all because, I mean, that's effectively what happened during the evolution of wheat cereals and their pathogens. That all looked very encouraging, so we managed to get into commercialising this idea of using uh, these variety mixtures uh, and that was in the early 70s and at first it was, it was wonderful. Uh, the whole thing grew exponentially. We saw farmers being delighted at using these variety mixtures because they, uh, once they got used to them they realised they didn't have to buy fungicides. They could just leave the crop and the disease would not be a problem. They could see it but it wouldn't develop to serious levels. <laughs>
So, for a young scientist, that was a very exciting time. But then uh, we found that there was a sudden decrease in sales. What was happening? Why is it that farmers weren't interested anymore? And the problem, of course, as a farmer, is you have to be able to sell your wheat or barley or whatever it is. And all of a sudden, people were not buying these mixtures. And I think the main thing at that time was not so much that it was something strange or looked odd in the field, but that people had to sell their wheat and barley for the baking process, bread making or beer making or you know, one of these big industrial developments. And those industries didn't want the mixtures. They had got used already to the idea of having an industrial feedstock, which was a monoculture, so that they could set all their dials and knobs and so on on their machinery and they would know that as one lot of cereals went through to make the bread, let's say, then the next lot would be exactly the same so they didn't have to change anything. I mean, that's simplifying it, but you know, that was the basic sort of principle. And so sales fell away, which was disappointing. However, interestingly, and this is a bit of a sideline, but it's an interesting sideline, at that time we had uh, a contract with East Germany for sugar beet uh, germplasm, and the guy that came and talked to us about the sugar beet got interested in what we were doing with these variety mixtures. And he thought this might actually be really rather good for East Germany, GDR, because they were finding it very expensive to buy West German fungicides for controlling the disease. So they started experimenting with variety mixtures in GDR. Um, and they did it, in one sense, a slightly better way than we'd done, in that when they were deciding on which varieties to use in their mixtures, they talked to the plant pathologists, obviously, and the plant breeders, but also to the end users, the people who were wanting to, in this case, malt the spring barley. And by doing that, they solved the problem, in a sense, straight away. So during the 80s, the 1980s, the area of variety mixtures in the GDR expanded very rapidly because the end users knew exactly what was coming in the variety mixtures and they had had a say, a decision, helped the decision as to which varieties to use anyway. So it worked extremely well and during the 1980s gradually the whole of the spring barley acreage in GDR switched from monoculture to mixtures. I have uh, in my office uh, an empty beer bottle. Uh, it was a beer a lager beer that I bought in one of the big supermarkets in the mid-1980s, which I was absolutely delighted with. It was a bottle of what was called Brandenburger Pils, so made in East Germany from the barley variety mixture. Great, very good price, and very acceptable <laughs> uh, lager beer. But then, as we all know, November 1989, the wall came down, the Berlin Wall, Germany's reunified, and what happened was that the, uh, the big German chemical companies came in, along with large farmers. So that change, in fact, meant that uh, it was a return to what was going on before, that is, large-scale monoculture, the use of fungicides, and so on. So, yeah, that attempt at increasing the diversity in the field, even a little bit, more or less failed again. However, I, at that stage, 
in the late 80s, I actually moved from Cambridge to Switzerland. We heard during the early 80s that, in fact, Mrs Thatcher, in effect, uh, as we all said, handbagged the Plant Breeding Institute. She didn't like it for the very reason uh, that it had become famous, that is, bringing scientists and breeders to work together. Her view was that the scientists were, in effect, public servants and should be working in civil society, but the breeders were producing varieties which belonged to the marketplace, so they should be working separately. So all the breeding part of the Plant Breeding Institute was sold off initially to Unilever, and it was then bought out by Monsanto. So the whole thing was effectively lost. Uh, but it was the way it was done, and the way in which my department was actually split down the middle. And I was very fortunate that uh, a senior post in Switzerland was available, and I was accepted for that. So my wife and I moved to Switzerland, and I was there for nearly nine years at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, which was extremely interesting and opened my eyes more to the sorts of developments that were possible in organic agriculture. But at the same time, I'd also, or related to that, I had heard just one word in, I remember very distinctly, in 1984 at the Plant Breeding Institute, when our crop physiologist, Roger Austin, just for some reason, I can't remember the context, he mentioned the word agroforestry. And because I really become interested in this idea of increasing diversity in the field rather than reducing it, which is what agriculture has been doing for donkey's years for a very long time, suddenly the idea of agroforestry, of integrating agriculture and forestry, I thought, ah, yes, of course, it's very simple. That's what we should be doing. <laughs>